Obviously, as you can see, the best way to introduce the, uh, the, the guys from television is to introduce them and then get the hell out of the way. Um, I, always, I always like hearing, uh, you know, coming in and, and seeing them at CG just really because they're in this, this great unique position where the people who are, are, are handling the properties now, who are running the, the company now, are the people who actually design the games. And so you just get that, that higher level of quality of their products. about that well. I, <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's, it's okay. This is this is your show. Um, and and so you know, really, it's it's great to come and and, and just to, to, to go to one source essentially and to hear the history of the products, and then and then they will sell you that history. Uh, <laughs> Thirty nine ninety five. Yeah, you're not getting out of here. Out of the booth. Yeah, reach. Uh, open open up your your ears and your wallets uh, and listen to. Uh, and I'll, I'll let these guys introduce themselves and then yes again get the hell out of the way. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know what, actually, let me, let me start off with a, with a question because you're, you're thinking of doing news stories for people who are here. And thank you for coming to the first panel on Sunday. That's, uh, that's, that's cool. Um, I was talking to Don Daglow at Dice, and he was talking about how Mattel had, had given you guys a lot of their licenses, but they would never, ever give you Barbie. And I, I'd be interested to hear a little more about that. So. Uh, well, <laughs> The, uh, it is true that we had we had licenses for a lot of things. We had East Games, and we had um, so we had Hammer uh, Barra and all of that. Uh, and then we had the Masters of the Universe, which was Mattel license. And the people who worked on it uh, and Mattel Electronics said they never had as much trouble dealing with a licensor as we had dealing with Mattel toys. Mattel toys aren't good. Mattel toys are just impossible. And, uh, uh, yeah, I think that the, the, the crown ones, the Barbie and Hot Wheels, we talked about it, but no, nothing has ever come of it. And, and just trying to deal with them on Master's Universe was a, was a nightmare. Um, they would come in and they'd say, oh, the, the Castle Grayskull, the tongue color, it can't be that color of green, it's got to be this color of gray. So we only have 16 colors, <laughs> pick one. <laughs> oh, this is too blood red, you got to off on that. So I know that Joe was doing the castle for the Castle Grace Gold, he was just tearing his hair out because they wouldn't let him be creative. They, they, just, they were the worst. They were just, uh, but that's just Mattel. They just absolutely protect their products. So, at the time, you know, the, I think it was actually during that time was the first time they ever actually had an actress portray Barbie. Even when they went to trade shows, they never had anyone dressed up as Barbie. I think that was in the 1980s. Was they, the first time they actually hired women to Play Barbie the shows. It was, it was a big deal. They actually had like these little Corvettes, pink Corvettes, and they had these girls show up at shows and everything. And, Ooh, it's Barbie, you know that. <laughs> and that was the corporate. It was a, a big deal. Well, let's talk about the format that we're using today. Oh, yeah. Um, essentially, we're just going to try to cover the uh, um, kind of the eras of Mattel, because our Mattel are trying to run television, because um, it went through some distinctive periods. Um, at the end here, Glenn Anderson was never a, um, an employee of Mattel Electronics, but of APH, which was a consulting firm first brought in to do this, because Mattel Electronics didn't have you know, a team of programmers who know anything about um, microprocessor or anything. They're making a little you know, pull the string and it talks type of, that was the technology, to suddenly make this jump from selling toys, which at the time were costing $5, 10 to something that was about $300, which was pretty scary to Mattel. So they brought in a company that had been had expertise in what's it called embedded software? Is that the uh, yeah, embedded systems or microprocessor system, right? microcontroller systems? And uh, Richard Chang, who was uh, the head of design and development at Mattel, uh, ran into Glenn Hightower at some uh, some seminar he went to, some college seminar or something on electronics, and and got hooked up with APH. Um, then after it looked like it was going to be successful, Mattel started wanting to bring it in the house because again, as you said, Mattel's control freak, so they wanted to bring the people in as close as possible, so they started actually hiring a staff of people. John Soule was the first person hired by Mattel specifically as an intelligent programmer. He yeah, was brought into who? Program in television. Right? Well, okay, well, he will correct me when we talk about um, And then I guess so we'll talk about you know, the early days of Mattel setting up in television, and then I'll go into a little bit more. Um, I guess you both went up to Activision, right? Both up to the uh, Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both went to Activision. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit then more about when 
Mattel Electronics got to like 300, 400 employees, uh, or just programmers. We had a couple thousand employees. Um, and then uh, the Nettle crashed, but uh, Intellivision was like the only game system that kept going because the uh, senior vice president of marketing thought, hey, you know, these video games might actually last for a while. He bought the rights to Intellivision, started a new company, and then hired um, some of the programmers to do new games through Dave Warhol, one of the programmers who then became the producer of all, I think, 21 new games or something through NTD Corporation, and kept it going through 1990. So it was a 10-year cycle for Intellivision, which for, that's about as long as any. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, I think Game Boy is going to last longer, and that's not, that doesn't look up to TV, so Ralph Bear would say, that's not a video game. Uh, <laughs> if he were here, <laughs> that's not a real video game. So why don't we start with Glenn, you can tell us about what APH was all about. And, yeah, and, uh, I'll, I'll do my best because uh, uh, I wasn't on the, the senior staff or anything. I just, uh, I just started as a summer intern uh, in 1980. After the the right. okay. um, I started APH in 1980, so the intelligence was already on the market by that time. Um, uh, but I got to work with you know, guys who had uh, written the exact, which was the uh, operating system that was inside the uh, inside the machine, and worked with a lot of the development tools that they created. Uh, ABH, um, as a microprocessor consulting firm, specialized in uh, both hardware and software. They made the development systems, uh, which would be the data widget, as it was called, and they made the uh, assemblers uh, that everybody used. If you guys use the same. Yeah. Some of, the, some of the other things, instead of doing television, you're doing like chips for microwaves and for yeah, space well, shuttles and I, things like that, right? I, I worked on, well, I worked on a, uh, you know, bowling alley system for keeping track of scores and displaying them to the, to the uh, players. Um, and they created one of the first uh, Ethernet boards for the DVD line of uh, mini computers. And so we were probably one of the first companies to actually have a local area network. Yeah, How many employees did APH have? Oh, we were around 20 or so. Okay. So what what games specifically did you work on? Oh, I worked on a couple of great games that never uh, were published. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Keith, you probably tell you about that. But you work on you work on NFL football, right? Well, I did work on NFL football. Um, I wrote the uh, instant replay code, and the challenge there was that uh, the um, the code that recorded the play had to take exactly the same number of clock cycles as the record that could have played it back, uh, including all possible branches. So that was a little uh, mind muddle that they gave. How did you record there was only like 47 RAM locations? Yeah. And, and 47 words RAM in the television. Well, it's yeah, data compression. <laughs> <laughs> one really, really powerful bit. Exactly. Now, they think you all know that you know, the NFL football was a 4K game. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's not 400, not 4 meg, 4K. So well, they seem to give me all the challenging problems. Um, there's a, 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 a great, a great guy, a friend of mine, who's got he's the father of one of the AMD microprocessors, and he's very favorite. He wrote an astronomy program, you know, planetarium, <coughs> not the stars. We couldn't do it without a floating point math package, and so we had to write that. <laughs> <laughs> But I do assume that at Caltech, yeah, yeah that, that, that's that's everybody, everybody there came from Caltech. Right? Basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Glenn uh, was a Caltech grad. His partner was an MIT grad, and they're um, an interesting story. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, they they started the company together, and then the one guy went back to MIT, I guess, to get a master's or something like that. And in the meantime, APH makes a deal with Mattel for royalties and millions of dollars and everything. The guy comes back from MIT, hasn't been around for five years, and says, "Where's my half?" <laughs> that was interesting, right? And uh, I think that's where you lost your senior staff because Glenn was determined more to take the company bankrupt rather than pay that guy royalties or any of the programmers. Yeah, yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> Hightower, high, Glenn Hightower, I think I mentioned. There was a, uh, if, if I got this right, the exodus of people leaving APH started a new company called Cheshire. Cheshire Engineering. Uh, Cheshire, and it's because uh, they disappeared from APH and all that was left was a smile. <laughs> and a number of the guys went on to uh, companies like Activision and uh, Barton Brothers and, and uh, other big companies today. Um, yeah. 
I, I'm always interested in the personality of people. I, I spoke with Glenn Hightower when I was first started in Television Lives, and I wanted to interview people. And I asked Glenn, Glenn who would run a gauge, uh, for the credits, who, who would have the games, who, pro, who programmed the games. And Glenn's response was, oh, you can just put down that I designed all the games. I hired some students to kind of program mm -hmm. and fill them out. And that was kind of, and, and when, the, when the senior staff left to form Cheshire, he told Mattel, he said, that's not going to affect us. They're not important people. They're, they're just, you know, these, were the, these were the key people who really had written the exec, David Roth, who written the exec, Shao Farley, um, um, uh, these people, these people who were going to use it, they're, they're really the key people, and they all left and said, not important because they actually made an offer to do games directly for Mattel. And, and Mattel, because of what Glenn said, uh, said, no, no, we'll pass. And so they went and did Beam Rider and, um, and uh, Dreadnought Factor for Activision, yeah. which are fantastic games that we could have had for Mattel, but, you know, Glenn had said, yeah. so yeah. he tells a little about his ego <laughs> or, <laughs> working with him. Well, yeah, well, that, that was one in the space. Um, we pretty much he felt he was the center of the universe, and uh, as long as he had a safe supply of you know, undergraduates out of Caltech, you know, paying them seven dollars an hour, he, he, he could uh, do anything. Um, and uh, you know, so he had he had, he had a good yeah, high churn rate. But did he have the goods? Was he a good programmer himself? Uh, I, I never saw him write it. <laughs> <laughs> As a manager? Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, he wasn't from any he outbursts in the middle of the hallways, but he? Uh, well, yes. <laughs> That was a lot of questions you didn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he, he uh, had some interesting personality first. Um, I don't know if we want to tell that story. No, you know. <laughs> no, not that this camera's running. <laughs> She's still around and uh, APH is still in business. And, yeah, they are. And, um, Surprising, man. And I'm sure he still has lawyers, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is that the games they did for Mattel were just fantastic. They, they were great. They were beautifully done. Space, space battle, baseball. And of course, Walter Blackjack and, and, well, and it's all the of things. The executive itself. The, yeah, just the concept of the operating system at the time was uh, very novel. I think it was the only machine with a built-in operating system. And uh, there were so many things that that operating system did. It made everybody program in the same style so you could interchange code much more easily and help each other out on projects. It was a, um, a great uh, yeah. kickstart for the platform. I mean, it's not a bad shifter. It's really made an <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, essentially the way the... Um, the, the executive work was really as a program. It really was a program that ran the machine, and what you programmed as the game were actually pretty much subroutines that it called because it, it had its own little cycle and it's going to it's going to check the hand controllers at this time and then it's going to dispatch to whatever routines happen if a button has been pressed. So your the structure was just really there and it uh, it was very compact. It was a 4K the, the program itself was a 4K cycle and I it was a 2K cycle and then 2K of extra Routines was a 4K, 4K ROM. 4K. Yes. So the, the original software, I think, had two 2K chips in it. I believe it was going to have a 2K operating system, and then they started adding things like the scoring routines and the sound effect routines, and add, 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 that bumped up into the 2K. Yeah. Really, really expanded that machine. <laughs> so. But you, so you guys were located in Pasadena. We are in Pasadena, and um, uh, you know, and how much interaction do you actually have with the Mattel people? That, mm -hmm. Very little. So in fact, every once in a while, uh, Don Bagwell would show up and uh, you know, I would show them around. I just got to talk to a couple of the senior guys just to see what the state of Florida was. But, um, you know, in keeping with one spirit that he was on there, um, you know, we were, we were very much uh, minimalized. We had a no, we didn't either, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I don't want to act it. Put our name in the box. Well, one of the other things, I mean, talking you know, about being a businessman, and getting a lot of money, but um, the deal that Glenn made, as I understand it, was that you guys essentially got paid for the records that I had, somewhere around between $25,000 and $30,000 for each game, total buyout from Mattel. No royalties, nothing on the intelligence games. Yeah, well, that was a uh, in a position to be familiar with the terms of contract, but my understanding was, even though know, we were getting seven an hour, we were getting 500 a day for our services. Yeah. Uh, but the games themselves, he really made a horrible deal. Well, he realized that when he saw millions of these games selling, yeah. and they had, they had gotten paid 25000 for baseball and then sold a million back. Right. 
Yeah. So I was going to jump now. The next stage is Mattel says, let's start doing this stuff in-house. And uh, so they start, they start staffing up. Like I said, there was a, Richard Chang was in charge of design and development. They've been doing some of the uh, little handheld games and everything. Some of the programmers there, Mike Meekoff, Ray Kessner, started training to do some uh, some programming on television with the APH guys. So I guess you saw some of those guys, right? Or you were later than that, or were you there? Okay, well, actually, back in the Okay, uh, so I was hired by Mattel in October 1980. And uh, I left for activism two years later, same month. Um, I worked at UCLA, I was a statistician. Um, I went to Princeton, I started off as a mechanical engineer, and that was, that was dead industry, so I went into uh, electronic engineering, and because uh, I like computers, and they, they started training me how to design antennas and wave guides and stuff that I didn't care about, so I never did statistics. Um, worked at UCLA Med School for about uh, four years as a statistician. Now. Eventually got so I didn't couldn't stand it anymore. Quit, um, and uh, was looking for the ads. It was on ad for toy designers at Mattel, and I said that's like kind of the perfect job. So I sent a resume and um, went down for an interview, and uh, uh, I interviewed with Mike Minkoff actually, and I was hired. So I had I've ever had a programming course, which was not so unusual in those days. Um, Princeton didn't even have a computer science department in 1973 when I, uh, you know, choose, well, choose your major. Actually, he's old. Born <laughs> <laughs> in 1954. Um, I'm born 55. <laughs> and was he 54? Actually, 53. Oh, he's <laughs> really old. <laughs> 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 okay, I don't get this confused. The age and the year of birth, the current date, but. <laughs> uh, I actually wrote my first computer program in 1968. It was in the and uh, my father was a professor at Penn State. And I would write the program at home, and he would take it to Penn State and keep punch it and put the cards in. It would be sent by wire to University Park, and he would take the print out and bring it back. John will now explain what a key punch is. He would print out back and say, basically say, you know, fail online seven. <laughs> that, was, that was the first kind of turnaround we had. And um, anyway, it's time, time to leave that, that environment. And I, I had bought my own computer in 1978, <coughs> month in Apple, and I'll scientific. But I used a 6502 processor, and I did a lot of playing around with electronics. Uh, so I was kind of new. I knew programming, I knew a little bit about electronics. And uh, uh, I started to work at the design development part of uh, Mattel, which was a group of about 40 people, and they were all men, so there were two secretaries that were women, um, and they're all guys in their 20s and 30s. Uh, some of them were electronic tech, some of them were art graphic designers, um, uh, you know, uh, a couple of people who had programming experience, but on very small, you know, orbit microprocessors. And they made Mattel handhelds, the handheld football, uh, I suppose, the probably some of the museum. Um, very simple games. Um, and Richard Chang was in charge of this department, so I was actually working for him. He, he had it set up so that everybody worked for him, so he was in charge of 40, 40 people. And I never really understood what he was saying, because his accent was very, very strong. And uh, so I, I, wouldn't, I couldn't quite follow what he was saying, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So I initially got hired. They didn't know what they were going to do with me. They figured that I was probably going to do one of the handhelds or something. But since I knew a little electronics and a, little, and a lot of programming, you know, I had to do something. And I'd been there a couple of weeks, maybe a week, when uh, Mike Minkoff and Rick Levine uh, were working on bowling and PBA bowling. <coughs> Mattel was very big on licensing. so. They would get the license. Instead of football, they got NFL football. And so they would always get an official license, Major League Baseball, for instance. That was worth a lot of money to them because apparently bowlers care if it's the professional bowling association bowling or just plain bowling. Uh, uh, Mike and Rick were working at APH in Pasadena. Pasadena is about 30 miles from Mattel, which is a, was a ballpark. And at the time, I, I lived in San Fernando Valley. I still lived, so it was about 30 miles on that triangle, and I ended up doing that triangle. 
driving some days uh, all around it, uh, the 90 mile round trip. Um, Mattel sort of didn't have anything, they didn't know anything. We didn't have a copy of the exec. We, we were given an a, 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 a instruction manual for the exec and for the assembler, but we had no development systems. Um, APH had a PDP-20 that uh, ran through the whole office and they had data widgets, which were big blue boxes. And if you download into the data widget, and that would run through the Intellivision and they had breakpoints, you could single step. Um, so we were completely at their mercy. I, I, I didn't know anything about the politics of this. Um, my impression was that, uh, well, it, uh, I thought, well, I worked, Mike Minkoff uh, had worked for Mattel for about five years. He was actually a programmer. Rick, I'm not sure what Rick Levine, he worked for Mattel as well. I don't know what his background was at Mattel. But I was the first guy hired who ended up working on television. But I wanted to correct that because I wasn't hired to work on television. They just hired me and said, oh, television, you must do that. And I was sort of, you know, I'll do anything. That's the way I'll do it. Um, I don't know if it's a statistician who's the only work on a big project, chemical carcinogenesis project, and had to analyze data on 15,000 rats who died of different kinds of ca cancer. So, maybe the transition from that to making toys was, was a big improvement. <laughs> um, so, I, I went over to APH uh, pretty much um, every day and looked over the shoulders of Rick Levine and, and Mike Minkoff, and they were, as they were doing polling. Rick Levine was a, a serious bowler, and uh, he wanted to make the game really good, and the game was really good. If you saw the, I mean, to me, the Atari bowling, there are, if you see the Atari 2600 bowling, which is a couple of lines on the screen and a thing that goes, and see the television bowling, which has things like the ball spin, and we could never get the sound of the pins right. We went, actually went to a bowling alley and tried to record the pins to see if we could get a good sound on that. So, um, a lot of stories. Um, I was, yeah. <laughs> okay, coming up in 1981, <laughs> Mattel actually, it, my, my impression was that uh, Mattel had decided to take over the Intellivision programming and the people at APH were just glad my entire wasn't very happy about that. So we were sort of, uh, you know, I don't want to say we were treated badly when we were at APH, but uh, we were exactly greeted with, um, you know, open arms. I think that part of that was Glenn's personality, part of it was APH was all Caltech people who are very intimidating and often not, not very socially adept. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I was intimidated because, you know, Caltech's as good as, as, good as there is. Um, and um, I was, I was in a, we were in a transitional period because they had hired a gentleman named Gabriel Baum from England was going to come in January of 81 and take over the television process and make it into a real team. They started to hire people about then. Um, so while I was in that, essentially with those supervision, I was right around, they, they said, why don't we, you know, one of the things Richard Chang said was, make us a copy of Asteroids, the arcade game. This was the transitional period, too, was between whether you could copyright a game or not. Turns out you could. At the time, they thought, oh, we just copy whatever's popular. <laughs> because the source code will be different, and you can't copyright, you can only copyright um, the uh, expression of ideas, not the ideas themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, I was playing the Asteroids last night, it's a really good game on the Empire Arcade. It's a vector, one of the vector games, the first vector graphic games. Completely difficult, if not impossible, to do anything like that on the television, because we were had eight moving objects. And I had in the back of my mind a game that had stuff falling from the sky and uh, bigger than all these rocks. So I made, and it was very easy, it wasn't the exact. It was very easy to make a prototype of a game. And the first one I had had, I had just, all of the graphics were window frames because it's easy to make on an eight by eight grid. You just fill in the outside. So the first version of Master Smash was falling window frames. And you shoot them and they blow up. And it was, that was the kind of thing you could do in a, a day or two because of the existence of the exec. And um, then, um, then I 
did some more work on that and um, brought copies back to Mattel. And uh, one day, Richard Chang stuck his head in my office and said, uh, I noticed that game, you've got those rocks falling. And I said, yeah, I thought it was a good idea. He said, uh, we really want you to do asteroids. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll do that too. So I did that, but I kept the other game. And um, it, this story is all on the website. <laughs> I was I was I was like a very very lucky guy because I had to get hired when there was nobody around to be in charge of me, and I didn't have to run this through a committee to get the approval of it. I just made things and took it back to Mattel because the development was done at APH. I worked there a lot, and I would go back to Mattel for administrative this and that, and I would bring back the key card, which is our prototype cards. There's some in the museum. And people at Mattel would put them in. There was a little tiny testing area that was under, I think the only game they had was skiing. But they would play that, that falling game, and our marketing guys would wander by every now and then and say, what's that? And uh, so, long story uh, uh, short, we ended up releasing it. And then that, plus the confluence of the Atari lawyers, we ended up, uh, and Mattel ended up releasing Master Smashers for Warm. Um, then I wanted to work on B-17 Bomber, and it was very difficult, and I ended up getting to work later and later, and I kind of over overdid it on that one. And I had uh, two brilliant people working for me. Uh, uh, what were their names? Uh, Stephen Fisher, Fisher and uh, Roney. Steve Roney. Um, boy, they were really good. Such great help. Um, but the way it worked was, because I was getting more and more antisocial, uh, and Mattel was just growing and growing. They were hiring people. They hired Don Danglo and, and uh, Russell Leaplick. And uh, it got to the point where every couple of days they'd bring in a new guy and say, hi, this is, you know, Fred. And I'd say, hi. And I, I got so, I, I was so focused on the game, I started to ignore the other people in the office. In the early days, we had very little documentation. I had written up some ideas after reading the, the, the stuff from General Instruments, which was, you know, all about engineer, engineering ease. And uh, I bring up some little old documents that had to have to have my name on them. And he gave them out to the beginning programmer. So I got this reputation as the guy who delivered He was the guy who was there. It wasn't true at all. But, <laughs> you know, I wasn't that spell stack. It was this mysterious <laughs> My impression was I was this mysterious guy who would show up at 4 p.m. and uh, stay work until the wee hours of the morning and then drive back home. So um, I did finish P-17 Bomber. It was a very difficult job, uh, and I think I over—I think I burned myself out. I, the next step would have been to work on the Atom computer. Atom? No. Atom was the Coleco computer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had a television. Yeah, the keyboard. What our keyboard one? Yes. Yeah, the one with the little. No, no, where is? No, no, the Aquarius. The Aquarius. Ah, yeah. yeah. The system for the seventies.
and the other 12 just fun new guys. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was, I was, I'm not very good at faces. I was, I was agreeable to people, but you know, when they show up a second time, it would be like, hi, how are you? I don't know who you are. Um, so, and that was one of the reasons I wanted, I was just, anyway, I wasn't happy at Mattel, and it wasn't entirely Mattel's fault. Um, they did very well by their own standards, but they, they had been a big industrial company and used to hiring clothing designers. So things like royalties and credits and uh, good work conditions were a little far. They made me a senior systems programmer, which meant I got a cubicle which is actually six inches bigger than the other cubicles. <laughs> and you know, that that was that was I was appreciative of the recognition actually. I knew it wasn't and then Activision said, you know, when you finish your first game we'll buy you a new car. And uh, I said <laughs> There were these share shares and company options. And uh yeah, your own office, two of them actually. That actually did credits. Oh yeah, I'm credit. And uh, so, you know, that was a little salary to start with. So that plus, you know, some other personal reasons I wanted to get out of LA, I did. And uh, uh then that's the story of the end vision. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <coughs> and okay, so I'll move on then. Um, I came in one year after John did, so I came in October of 1981. Um, and we were still, uh, at that time, we still hadn't quite congealed into the Mattel Electronics. Um, it was all still, there's some space here in this part of the building, space here. There were um, three different areas where programmers were kind of jammed in in the Mattel Toy Building. Uh, but finally, at the end of 1981, they actually spun off Mattel Electronics from being just part of the design and development team to its own, corp its own company under the Mattel Incorporated brand. There was the Mattel Toys, and now down the street they were going to build, the, uh, they, they took an old warehouse that they had rented out for years to Northrop and they took it back and converted it to the Mattel Electronics building and staffed up. Um, and that, that happened like the end of 1981, beginning of 1982. Like I say, hired in um, uh, Don Daglo, uh, Mike Minkoff as, as directors, or actually they were managers. They hired uh, Gabriel to uh, be the director of it. He became vice president when uh, they actually made the corporation. And they really started putting a corporate structure on it and all that. And still, we had a delay of development of like three or four months because uh, we didn't have phones, we didn't have development systems hooked up. It was just uh, a lot of people sitting around playing video games for a lot of time then because, uh, well, we can't really do any work. <laughs> Uh, had to share all of that. And then the politics did start coming into play as to who had what areas. Uh, we started doing the, the games for the um, Atari 2600, we started doing games for the PC that had just come out, and in PC in 1981 came out, and um, we started doing games for that for Apple II, um, and then our own little Aquarius computer. So you started getting these little departments. Um, and, and there was some status in there. You know, some people, well, we're, we're on the Intellivision team. We're not one of those Atari 2600 people. But then the Atari 2600 people say, hey, we, we're real programmers. We don't have this simple, uh, this exact thing to play with. We have to, we have to count we have to count lines on screen to do our timing and all of that. So, so there was a real kind of <clears throat> jockeying for position there. And the, the growth was explosive. Uh, like I said, you were 120 people at Mattel in in Hawthorne, but I don't think that's even counting the people who were in design and development that were also programming, and the people we hired a team in France, it was made up half uh, English programmers, half French, we had a team in Taiwan, we had a team in Hong Kong. Um, so there were programmers all around the world working on, on material. Um, 1982, the video game industry was had an explosion of growth uh, of games, and Mattel made like 100, 150 million dollars that year, and then that growth continued. So it was such a glutton market that 1983, we lost 385 million. I think was the figure. So it was just <laughs> a crash of the of the whole industry. Um, I just want to talk about one thing about about John. We talked about the documentation that he did. I, I probably told the story before. I apologize, but he did. He came in. He documented everything, and that's why. People went to that, you know, to the, the documentation did well. And one document described the colors. Described the colors, the 16 colors. So there was like this blue. And it was like blue, kind of cerulean blue. Sort of the blue of a spring morning. <laughs> and the yellow, 
yellow, kind of the uh, the Rat Pack yellow. <laughs> or it's not Rat Pack. The, uh, <laughs> what was the uh, show? The, the show? Uh, rat Control. Rat Control. The Rat Control <laughs> yellow or something like yellow that. Yellow that the Germans. During taxi, <laughs> 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 described each one of these in great detail. I mean, for, for the documentation was just uh, was very specific. Um, so yeah, so at the same time that we were trying to hire all these people, we were also trying to figure out how to train them with that documentation. You had seminars, programmers who had been there for just a few days, were suddenly teaching other programmers things. Um, some of the managers had a very hands-off attitude. I know the people who worked for Russ Half said that they. You know, he would hire people and then they'd walk in and go, all right, here you go, and he'd throw a copy of the uh, documentation in and point to a um, television and say, go have fun. <laughs> and others would really, you know, get in there and try to take you through all the steps and all that. Uh, Mike Meekoff was very detail-oriented with, uh, with Yeah, a lot of the people they hired, it, it, either they weren't programmers primarily or they had not had any experience in assembly language programming. Yeah, this is a, a good point. Uh, yesterday, somebody came up to the booth and said that uh, he's studying game design at some college. And I'm going, yeah, that's just remarkable to me because we walked in and there was no game design. There were mostly people never seen computers and, you know, until they were adults. Um, it's fascinating with that. Um, and in fact, uh, Russ Liebler was one of the programmers hired, and I guess I can tell this right now because unfortunately he passed away a couple of years ago. But Russ was hired to be a programmer and um, got in and, and Mike Minkoff discovered that the guy couldn't program. He just was not a programmer. He was a great musician and he did music. He did the theme for Snap the which was like one of the first video game mm -hmm. music to play during the game. And, and the, first, the first sound he did for the video game was actually turn up an Astro Smash when he hit the hyperspace key. And it goes pew! <laughs> That's his sound. The other sound I did. And, uh, <laughs> I remember the word, it was review in Playboy magazine. He said, it's a good game, but it sounds like a 10 cent cat pistol. <laughs> I'll never forget that. But anyway, so Russ, Russ came in, the guy who's a program, he could program. And so, um, you know, Mike Minkoff said, you've got to stop. You know, we've got to do something about this. So Minkoff created what was called the Minkoff measure, which was essentially just like about six or seven lines of code. It was a subroutine that, to, that switched bits on and off on it. In a word, and every programmer that would come in, or every uh, interviewer that would come, interviewee that would come in, um, we would give them this Minkoff measure and just ask them to describe what it was doing. And that was kind of, you know, now people go and get degrees and you can actually, you see a resume that they've got a degree in game design or whatever, we had the Minkoff measure, eight lines of code that you talk about for five minutes. Uh, and that was, that was just, he put that, you know, Mike Minkoff did that just so that we wouldn't get more people like Russell in there who just couldn't program. Um, because we're getting people, Mattel wasn't going to pay top dollar for programs. They weren't sure this thing was going to go. So they were hiring people who um, uh, didn't have degrees in computer science. They were people who were uh, artists or musicians or, or had gone to law school or whatever and had taken some classes um, uh, in, in computers along the way. Um, uh, Andy Sells, one of our, turned out one of our great programmers, he had been a, um, he had been playing in the piano bar at the Tony Roman's Ribs in Santa Monica. When his wife got pregnant, he thought, boy, I've got to get a real job. <laughs> and a friend said, oh, go down to the computer learning center and learn how to program. And went down to like a six-week course or something like that and came and tell him hired him. Um, because we like to hire people who are creative as opposed to people who are just, you know, technical people. What other background, by the way, before you got to the I have a master's in science and computer science from the Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was, I was, but I've been working in special effects and film. So that's, that's why Don, the, the, the reason I got hired was that I had been working in special effects and um, I had just gone over to a company called Information International in Culver City uh, because a friend of mine knew the guy there and they were doing stuff with direct um, uh, to film. They, what they were is they were a company that did microfiche and they had figured out a way to actually put that on the film. And so they were doing, they had done some television commercials and some special effects, and they were doing special effects with movie Tron. And so I had just talked to those guys, and then I heard the radio ad that, oh, they're doing video games. So I went over there and talked to them, and said, oh yeah, and I was just over the, they were, they're doing this movie Tron about video games, and not knowing that Mattel had the Tron license. Don Daglo had just been promoted to director, and he had been working on the Tron game, he didn't have time to do it anymore. He was looking for somebody to take over the Tron game. I walked in the door with a master's in computer science, 
and had just been interviewing about and talking to people over who were doing the movie Tron. He said, this is the guy to do the Tron game, and so I got hired. Um, that was my background. <laughs> but most of the people who came in, I think, didn't have those computer degrees. Now, what happened was, when Mattel, in 1982, made these millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, suddenly the people high up said, we can't trust this company to a bunch of kids. This is our first job out of college that don't have computer degrees. We gotta get some real experienced people in here. So they said, we gotta get, from now on, don't hire anybody who doesn't have two or three years experience out in the real world working with microprocessors. And they said, well, we're, the pay scale in Tel at the time was $18,000 to $27,000 starting salary for a program. And they said, we can't get them for that price. So okay, you can start hiring for $35,000. So in 1982, we hired a whole bunch of programmers, experienced programmers, $35,000. And then we had all the programmers who were the experienced programmers who had done games and were making $25,000. Suddenly in the cubicle next to these guys making $35,000 who didn't know what they were doing. And that created a real rift at Mattel, a real political thing. It was like, hey, hey I've got a game under my belt, I'm making $25,000. And Mattel had very careful corporate uh, rules in place of how much of a raise you could give people. So you couldn't just say, okay, well, you can make $35,000 either. No, we, if you get a good review, you can get an 18% raise, and then if we promote you, you can get another 10% on this grade, and you can only have a review once every 12 months, but on a special case of nine months. And so, you know, Don Dagwell and Mike Minkoff were just doing, we were trying to bring the staff that had experience up to the level of the staff that had no experience pay-wise. Mattel was, a, as I said, a very big, it was a big Fortune 500 company. It had been founded 30 years before. Primarily made Barbie dolls. Barbie was, uh, has always been the, uh, the lifeblood of companies, the crown jewels of the company. Um, and they, they, we were, they were trying to compete in an area of which is really filled with rambunctious startups of, you know, people like you know, Steve Wozniak and uh, and uh, companies that move very quickly. Companies yeah. that that didn't have this corporate structure in place, and, and if this was, if something was going this way, they could zag that way. Um, and Mattel was going along, I and mean, the real thing about Mattel was it was marketing driven. It was all, everything was very carefully researched marketing. Now in the early days of the games, where they didn't market people kind of hands off, like when John was developing Astro Smash, there was a lot of freedom there, because, oh, we don't know what we're doing, get this out there, but then when they got to a certain point, it's like, oh, well, We've got to get these licensed characters. We're doing Rock and Roll well, unless we have, you know, unless this is the Yogi Bear game. So, <laughs> what, what, how are we going to do a Yogi Bear game? And how is that game going to be done on the Intellivision and the Atari 2600 and the Aquarius and the IBM PC and the Apple II so that it will look the same and act the same on all these very different game machines? But this is, and the marketing department will just come in and say that's the way it's got to be done. There was a lot of freedom. On it until July of 1983, after the CES in Chicago, and that's when it was very clear that all the stuff that we've been developing wasn't going to fly. The market was glutted, and they fired all the top management and brought in new people. And and new people simply said, "This is how we're going to do it." it became very marketing. You know, everything came from the, from the marketing department saying, "This is what you're going to release. This game is it." We had. Uh, kind of a Black Friday day when uh, a guy named um, <coughs> Jeff Rockless, who was the um, consultant to the president of the company, came in and went and looked at everybody's game. Went up and down the cubicle, looked at everybody's game. Well, the programmer sitting there going, ah, not the maze game. No, we're not doing this one. <laughs> and they said, oh, that's cute. That's pretty good. But I don't like the uh, main character. Change that uh, penguin to a, um, an old prospector, an old prospector. Yeah, Chop and Sam. Let's call this the Chop and Sam game. We we'll move on to the next one. And all these programmers are sitting there going, Oh my God. <laughs> I'm fired now because they were letting do best when they were just starting layoffs. And so suddenly a person who's been working on a game, this guy comes in and goes, Nope, this game's no good. Um, and it just, it just devastated that whole day. And I went into the vice president's office, Gabriel, and he was on the phone to the president of the company at the time saying, that guy is never getting back on the floor of this building. He's never, he's never walking back into our, our office. I don't ever want to see that guy again because he just destroyed the morale. Luckily, that guy was fired about, a, about three or four weeks later. And, <laughs> and everything kind of changed again. Every day, as, as Mr. Warhol used to have a great expression, every day brings a new direction. 
<laughs> so, um, so they, like they said, they fired it. They tried to, they tried, they brought in new marketing people, a new staff, uh, desperately trying to save things toward the end of 1983. But the glut was out there such that there was just, even though in 1983 there was a 10% increase in demand for video games, it was about a 3,000% supply increase, and um, and there was just the, there was not enough slice of the pie for everybody. Everybody got out of the business. Mattel sold the company off to uh, the senior vice president, Terry Bolesky, who said, you know, there's still a market out there for these games. These people who have television, they're still going to want games. He put together a group of investors, and they bought everything. Uh, the investors were really just interested in liquidating the assets of the company, the inventory. They spent the next year or so doing that, and then once they had pretty much gotten rid of all, almost all the hardware, all the, all the games were in stock, um, where there was just about nothing left. Terry said, can I buy the company from you? And they said, sure, you can, you know, there's nothing left except for the intellectual property. And Terry said, okay, now we're gonna design new games and went out to find the original programmers. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I asked Terry Bolesky and Dan Stout was his business partner, uh, having just acquired the intellectual property, went out to find the original programmers and they found Bill Fisher. Uh, Bill Fisher, who isn't uh, here today, but he's talked on the house before. Bill had been keeping in touch with uh, Dan and Terry over a couple of years to uh, to just provide minor technical support, hoping for the day that the, the systems would become uh, re revitalized again. And um, he was being really patient that nothing was happening. And um, and Terry needed uh, uh, needed help at a CES, a trade show. And so he asked Bill, Bill, will you come out and uh, run this uh, trade show, come and provide technical support at the trade show? Bill couldn't do it, so he asked me to show up. And I came out and set up their booth and watched them uh, sell into Toys R Us and all this, get kind of bringing things back up. And um, and for uh, for some reason, that uh, based on the rapport I uh, had with Terry and Dan at that point in time, um, they, he said, "Hey, Dave, how would you like to um, put together some new products for us?" Even though he'd been talking with Bill for a while, so there was a little there was a little edgy there between me and Bill for a while until. A couple of years later, Terry went out of business uh, <laughs> owing me $75,000, and uh, so Bill was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I don't mind, I don't mind not having worked with uh, those guys at all. Um, uh, but um, we had a number of challenges in the first, you know, getting this thing uh, going again, and um, it's very much like the early days of Mattel, I would say, because um, we didn't have any development systems. All of the development systems had been sold off or uh, dismantled and what have you and worked on PDP computers. Um, we didn't have the source code of the games that we needed. Uh, we didn't have a compiler, you know, anything like that. So we just really needed to start it uh, from ground up. And uh, uh, so we had some archives of these, of all of the software. Uh, Part of Terry's strategy was to make like super pro football, super pro baseball, keep enhancing the games that we had. So we wanted the source code back, um, but it was all on archived on something called two and a half density disks. Mattel had originally uh, bought some specialized computers that had a custom format and a floppy disk, but you couldn't put it in a floppy disk drive and read it unless it had a special controller. And these were these were big age floppies, by the way. Yeah, I think they had up to 100K on them or something like that. And uh, um, he, uh, for, uh, when I received all of the archives, I had given them over to Keith and, and asked him to figure out how to get them uh, on there. And so actually, Keith is the is the reason that we got most of that stuff. Um, Can I find something about that very quickly? All right. I'm sorry. You see, the thing was, when Mattel went out of business, or, or closed out, okay, I keep saying Mattel went out of business, Mattel Toys never went out of business, but Mattel Electronics, um, until shut us down, they they hired Mike Minkoff and Mike Green, or they, they were the two who were not fired, not laid off, to archive everything. And the because these Andromeda systems had this proprietary two and a half density storage that only the Andromeda computers used, everything was supposed to be stored and archived on single density, single density storage. And Mike, Green, and Mike Green was in charge of that. And Mike Green, I guess, was lazy because he didn't do it that way. He archived everything on the two and a half density because he figured who's ever going to want to look at these things again. So all of these games that were supposed to have been archived at single density, but we got them and looked at them and said, oh, they can only be looked at with these proprietary machines. Um, when Dave asked me to see if I could 
recover that data, uh, I tracked down through Mattel what happened to the Andromeda systems. They had been bought by a company that was in Silmar. They had been smart enough to realize that, hey, we don't want to use this stupid proprietary thing. So they had bought new controller cars to use the standard digital equipment double density. And so they had replaced all the controller cars. When I talked to them, I said, I think we still have those in the warehouse someplace. And luckily, the guy was a nice guy. He never charged me anything for it. But he went to his warehouse. He got out the Andromeda controller cards, put them back into the these Winchester drives. And, and I was able to transfer the stuff to a PC, just through a serial cable to a PC, and, and recover all this stuff. But it was just remarkable that, you know, there's this major company archiving stuff, and it's like, they just why today people say, well, where's this game? Where's that game? How come this game was worked on? Why don't you have that game? I said, because Mattel was probably the best at archiving stuff. These other companies, iMagic, Activision, everything, the companies that have since gone bankrupt and all that, um, and come back under a new form, or Atari, which is Infogrounds, which is whatever, uh, they don't have any of these archives. This stuff has all been lost. Uh, it was remarkable we were able to save this because some guy had kept a controller card. So uh, yeah, we, we did get the source code. Um, then there was a problem not having a compiler. I uh, taught myself the C language over a couple of months by writing a compiler. And the goal was, now that we had the source code, uh, there were two different compilers we used at Mattel. And I, was, I wrote a compiler that would read either format and generate a binary code that matched the ROMs. And that was a, a couple month process. So we got that going. Actually, there were assemblers, right? Not compilers. Assemblers, yes. Uh, oh, uh, I, I should say, uh, speaking back to the earlier point, I'm one of those people who never studied computers. <laughs> uh, I have a degree in music composition, but uh, and I didn't join Mattel just to be a, a musician or, or do music sound effects. I was really into games as a hobbyist and writing games on my own through college, uh, mainframes and things like that. So I was just passionate uh, individual uh, like that. So um, then the. Then the problem of development systems came up of trying to download in new games, new ROM images into the Intellivision. And we had RAM cartridges where you could stick a 4K or 8K of RAM into an Intellivision. And initially, my approach was going to be to um, connect the hand controllers of an Intellivision to a parallel port on a PC, because the hand controllers were I.O., 8-bit uh, I.O. ports. I was trying to write a small kernel program that would read the eight data lines and then latch it and then read another byte and latch it. That wasn't going anywhere, but fortunately a friend of mine, um, Scott Robitel, uh, hardware designer, uh, was in between jobs and said, hey, how about if I put together a ROM emulator for you? I think I can do this. So with the schematic diagrams from the television, he came up with a, a much better development kit than we even had at Mattel. This is a card that sat in your PC that had maybe 16K uh, of RAM and a cable that just stuck right into the uh, Intellivision and uh, uh, in the cartridge slot. So from there, we were able to just compile Link and Go uh, very effectively. Um, so, so once we got the development kits um, up and running, uh, then it was just a question of finding the people who um, I've been keeping in touch with who wanted to uh, make some more games. And this was uh, Steve Ettinger, Rick Koenig, John Tomlinson. John Soul did some work uh, in this period of time, too. Uh, but uh, Terry would hire me per, pretty much to do anywhere between six and eight games over maybe an eight or nine month period. And uh, we dole them out. Uh, Connie Goldman uh, did the graphics for us uh, during that period of time. And, uh, and at that point in time, it was kind of a virtual company because um, we all were working at home. Um, uh, you know, now with internet speeds and things like that, it's possible for people to work at home. But we were, um, we had, People in the Bay Area, people down in San Diego. Uh, I was at, working out of LA, and the games were so small we really could share assets in you know two or three minutes at a 300 baud modem, you know, um, uh, eventually 1200, 2400, or what, what have you. Um, so, um, so we were because we had all learned how to work on the intelligent. It was we didn't need to be in the same room at the same time, and uh, we popped out another I don't know 20, 25 games uh, through that that period of time, until um, um, uh, I guess a couple years later, as the 8-bit Nintendo became popular, um, the Intellivision just uh, you know couldn't couldn't play up against that, and uh, so that was that was kind of what was going on during that during that era. By the way, I by that time after Mattel, I, I I'm a cartoonist and, and graphic designer and so. I um, had gone into other stuff. 
And I got this phone call from Dave where they said, hey, they want to do new games for Intellivision. Keith, you could, you could do the cover. You could do the artwork for the cover. And I said, yeah. And at the time he called me, I was in Chicago on vacation. I said, yeah, as soon as I get back from Chicago, I'll give him a call. And he said, call him now. And so I called and I got the job. So on, on all these games that, that Dave was doing, I did all, I wrote all the instructions and designed the covers and did the catalogs for INTV. And so, and I was working out of my home. And uh, I remember, I think that we were going to modem something and Dave had a 24, 2400 baud modem and I had a 1200 and he was making fun of me. <laughs> oh, 1200, why don't you just whistle it over the phone line? Come on! <laughs> but yeah, we were just, uh, this was just bulletin board stuff and uh, uh, insane. But yeah, I mean, and frequently it was just, you know, we lived in the same city. So uh, it's like, well, we can try to open the motor more. Eh, why don't we just uh, go to lunch and uh, I'll get a copy of uh, the ROM and some of whatever so, to, to look at it. So um, yeah, in television, Lasted the, the last games that they were doing was in 1990. I think the ones in 1989, Christmas of 89, was when Stadium My Buggies and Spiker Super Bowl Volleyball came out. And then um, we're working on the, uh, the, the pool game, which was last one completed in 1990. And by that time, <coughs> Terry had filed for bankruptcy protection. And the company actually went bankrupt in 1991. And in 95, I started the website just to kind of was the credits and the history and all that, and there was so much a response from all of you people saying we want to play the games again that uh, uh, we talked to Dave and you would have been looking for Terry Blusky. I don't know that. I don't know that. <laughs> well, yeah. well the thing was, Terry, Terry went bankrupt. He owed everybody money. He owed me money when he went under. He owed Dave a lot of money. He owed me about 40000 You owed Dave about 100000 or whatever. Yeah, but plus the legal fees he did to try to recover it. <laughs> uh, my actual one, I think, right? <laughs> 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 I broke my ankle, became his lawyer, so. Um, but, um, um, but, so Terry kind of disappeared, and uh, when, the, when emulators started coming out, I think Dave had the idea of, gee, we could do some television stuff, and we wanted to see where that was, and, and uh, I was getting response on the, on the web, so we looked at doing that and everything, and, and I think David would have some lawyers or something looking for Terry who couldn't find him because he was in hiding. And, uh, and um, so Steve Roney uh, and, and I were talking about doing it. And just by total coincidence, a friend of mine from high school was at a birthday party I was having and he mentioned, or I mentioned in television, he said, oh, well, you know Terry Bolesky? And it turned out that the ad agency he was working for, Terry Bolesky was the liaison for Pac Bell in Northern California with the ad agency, and so we were able to get in touch with them and purchase the rights to the television that way. So, and the rest is history. <laughs> so, I see the guy over here is indicating we got like two minutes left. Yep. Is there two minutes worth of questions anybody would have for any of us? Every day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How many of those games did you sell? Like in you know the '85 to '90 period. Well, uh, uh, INTV Corporation, INTV Corporation did all those. I don't know. Do you have any figures on the uh, on the manufacturing runs? We really don't. I talked to Dan Stout on the phone a, a little while ago, and, and just based on the number of things we turned out, they were probably in like the hundred thousand range um, for the games that they were initially doing. Actually, when Nintendo came out, I was saying that Nintendo ultimately killed Intellivision. At first, when Nintendo came out, it spiked. It, it, it made Intellivision grow because with the new interest in video games, people started pulling their televisions out of the closets and then they started, uh, some of the stores were still actually carrying in 1986, 87, Toys R Us and Walmart I think were still carrying um, in television games from INTV Corporation. So they, they, did some, they did pretty well. The later games probably only did like 20,000 copies or so. Nothing compared to what Mattel was doing where 500,000 was kind of a medium game. Um, hit games were a million copies. John Souls Astro Smash was the first non-sports game to go over a million sales. Uh, flop of Mattel was like 300,000 games, so uh, so certainly what happened to ITV was much smaller, but um, uh, still respectable. It, it, it enabled uh, Terry Blosky had two Jaguars, so he'd probably be driving one, and the other one was in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get around these either. <laughs> <laughs> um, you say that uh, I mean there were really no game credits back then, right? Until Activision came about. 
Uh, I went on your website and I tried to look for who did the box art. You said you did it uh, when it was uh, in TV. Yes. On TV. Yes. Uh, that original box art is so uniform yes. and so beautiful. It's not a bit. I'd like to know who actually did that. Um, I wish I could remember his name right now. I only found this is this is where the weird coincidences of the world come about. Um, <laughs> I hate to say this. Um, at my health club about six months or so ago, I was getting a massage, and the woman who was giving me the massage told me that she used to work for Mattel in the visual design department. I said, oh, did you ever know who did the games for, the, the art for the Mattel box? And we could never find that information. She goes, oh, yeah, I don't remember his name, but he was the boyfriend of this woman I know. She was able to find the phone number for this woman that I called up, and she had for years, this had, they had lived together. He died about 10 years ago. But she said, yes, he's the one who had done all the artwork, and she gave me his name, and uh, she is going to try to find any photos or anything she has, memorabilia, and I got to get together with her. But uh, I sent her a copy of the television lives and the poster with all the games on it, and she was real happy with that. But yeah, it was just somebody in the, um, when, when Mattel Electronics spun off from Mattel, and we were our own company, we did not have our own visual design department. We used Mattel toys. so. We didn't have a lot of contact with them, but the, all of the um, instructions and all of the artwork and everything was done at Mattel Toys. And so this guy was just a staff uh, artist at Mattel Toys. Sort of a sequel to that question. Was there ever like box art you got back? You're like, that's not what we had in mind for the original game. Like, that it didn't match the vision of, of the, uh, of the game. <laughs> uh, It was only. I mean, as far as I know, they, they once they got a picture, they stuck with it. And yeah. it's, it's to my annoyance that the, the official publicity photo of Master Smash shows about 12 objects in the screen, and there can only be five. <laughs>